You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Rob. Hello, David. Hello, Will. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. We are really excited to have you. Dear listeners, this is a special episode that we're going to call The Art of Common Descent. Mm -hmm. A chat with paleo artist Rob Soto in honor of the artwork that we recently released. It's a part of our five-year anniversary celebration. Yes. I'm excited to be a part of it. If you watched our five-year anniversary live stream, or if you have been to our Zazzle store, you have seen the new merchandise that we've put up. Yeah, that is now covered in awesome art. Covered in fantastic <laughs> art are pieces of artwork depicting different fossil sites throughout time. That is artwork done by Rob. Rob also did our five-year anniversary logo that mm -hmm. is all over our social media. This special episode is an opportunity for us to introduce Rob to our audience, talk a bit about our history with art and commissioning art from Rob, and especially to give the artist's insights and behind-the-scenes background info on how our five-year anniversary art came to be. There's a lot of fun stuff to talk about from the background, from the story of that art. But before we get into that, let's meet our artist. Rob, please introduce yourself for our listeners. Well, this is such a glowing introduction already. Uh, hello, <laughs> listeners. I am Rob Soto. I am known by the nom de plume on social media as Raptor Rob. I'm a freelance scientific illustrator uh, with a focus on paleo art. And I've been doing that since 2016, I think. It's been that long, yeah. Great. And since you mentioned social media, where are you on the social media in case people already want to find you? Good question. Yes, I, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are my corners of the web. I'm a too old and afraid of TikTok, so <laughs> don't look so for you me can there. Search Raptor Rob. No, was some other kid is on there. <laughs> <laughs> now you've done. Uh, we are not, of course, your only artistic clients. You've done artwork for museums and for researchers uh, as well. That's right. So as a freelance uh, science illustrator, I do work for basically anyone who is involved in science communication, uh, which includes, as you mentioned, museums. Uh, I'm in the ALF Museum of Paleontology uh, with a, with a um, mutual friend, Gabriel uh, Santos. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, cool. he's working there. Um, and also... Andy Farkey. That's right. Andy Farkey. Both, both of them have been on the podcast. Yeah, true, true. Andy Farkey was at uh, SciFest in St. Louis, and mm -hmm. Gabe is on our Diversity in Paleo mm -hmm. anthology. Yeah. Uh, both of them are incredible people, and uh, Andy was a big mentor for me um, after I graduated from CSUMB, and I did my internship with the ALF. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me Let me take you back origin story <laughs> i was gonna say actually yeah tell us about your education did you so it was your degree in art yes it was uh so i went to the maryland institute college of art uh, better known as mica and i studied illustration but i wasn't always going to be pursuing a career in the arts um, i'd always been interested in art always been kind of creative and like every little kid obsessed with dinosaurs <laughs> i can remember very very clearly my my father came back from the smithsonian uh he was doing a uh um he was there for work in dc and came back with this small stegosaurus and i was only familiar with like dragons and monsters and things like that so when i saw this thing i was like this is a monster this is great what is this thing <laughs> and my father was like no this was alive this used to be here on this earth this very planet where you and i are standing there were these creatures called dinosaurs and they were huge and they were crazy cool and now they're gone and this is you know early 90s we didn't we weren't quite sure why they were gone so there's still that mystique which really captured me <laughs> and i was like wow tell me more he was a doctor my both my parents are in the, the medical profession so i was very encouraged to explore the uh the scientific binomials to memorize their names to start learning their bones 
And for me, when I am struck by beauty of any kind, I'm compelled to participate in that. When I, when I see a, a landscape or a creature, um, and this is a, a feeling many artists will recognize, I'm compelled to to participate in that in that dialogue. And for me, that that meant drawing. So the more I learned about dinosaurs, the more I wanted to draw, and the more I learned about art. So they were kind of parallel for a long time. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a really great intro story. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Well, that that <laughs> compulsion to participate, that makes total sense that yes. that is a, a driving force for art. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people feel it, you know, you pull out your smartphone, you want to take a picture, you want to capture it. It's that same drive, just cranked up to 11. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't until years later, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be an author, you know, a journalist or something, something where I could make a story, but I never stopped drawing. And it was actually my mother that, uh, so both my parents played a big part in, uh, in getting me to where I am. My mom started putting, she noticed I was buying uh, how-to books, you know, ways to improve myself as an artist. And she's like, why don't you look at art school? And we were in Maryland, we were outside DC, so very close to MICA, which was a reach for me. I got in, majored in illustration, and um, I did a couple small commissions, uh, mostly from friends and one professional for a wine label. And uh, it was probably the, the hardest lessons I've ever learned because I was not professional yet, and I didn't know the rules, and I tried, I knew I was supposed to give them a, as you guys are familiar with, I knew I'm supposed to give my client a, a contract, mm -hmm. and he was like, you're not a real artist. I'm doing you a favor. I'm not signing a contract. And Oof. I was like, he was rough. Yeah, man. Oof. Mm. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last few years, I've known a number of early career artists mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. struggling with that same issue of how to be an artist and how to deal with clients and how to comport yourself and what to ask for and all that. I've known a handful of sort of college age students learning how to go through those steps. And it's tough, especially when it's new. It's very difficult. And I'm very grateful every day for my education by the, uh, the California State University of Monterey Bay. Um, that science illustration program is the best in the country. There are one p possible rival at um, RISD, and mm. it does not compete. I'm sorry. <laughs> not, even, not even close. Sorry to all RISD folks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you're RISD fired. out there, I'm sorry. I just made Where, Where's RISD? What, what is RISD? Uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. Gotcha. And they have a, a kind of natural art program, but this is science illustration. It's very clear. Very different. Gotcha. Um, and they, apart from teaching us every possible uh, medium you could be asked to do. Uh, of, we, we had a very rigorous uh, section of the business of illustration out beyond the studio where uh, we learned about copyright law, we learned about how to make contracts, how to present ourselves, how to reach out. These are things you know that, that Micah, my undergrad, you know, kind of touched on, but this was specific for the field. So once I came out of um, CSUMB with... You know, just a, an, an amazing amount of support from my classmates and from the professors. Uh, things really turned around after that. So if you're looking to to become, you know, full time as an artist, and you're having you're having some trouble getting off the ground, you know, a little bit more of schooling is is never a mistake, uh, unless it's too expensive, in which case it's a mistake. You shouldn't do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough out here. Uh, yeah. But for me, I mean, not a day goes by that I don't use something I learned uh, from my time there. And it was actually around that time that I was introduced to you guys. I oh, yeah. discovered the Common Descent podcast somewhere on Apple, I think. <laughs> and it was a really, really fun to find something, you know, in this new art form back then. I mean, this was 2017, 2018. Podcasts were not what they, you know, the the uh, the mountain of media that it is today was still kind of new. <laughs> and um, it was really fun to find, you know, two guys that were talking about paleo stuff and, and teaching me something. Paleo stuff and all the pop culture references that you recognize. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> 
Okay, I got that reference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you work. So the work that you've done for us has all been digital media. That's right. You've done illustration, and it's all digital. Do you have other media that you work in? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, um, I'm a big. I mean, I've always been uh, a big drawer. Or a draftsman is a better way to say that. Ooh. I love to sketch. I love to draw. And um, I have, that's graphite is, is what I have the most experience in. Um, but I really like pen and ink. Ink washes are some uh, really good markers, um, which is a less messy version of ink washes. Cool. When I'm out in the field, technical term, outside, <laughs> drawing from the zoo or doing landscapes, you know, out in nature, uh, watercolor, like really simple washes are, are a lot of fun. I, yeah, I, I try to practice with those traditional media um, as often as I can. But on a daily basis, I'm being asked to do things rather quickly. And to a level of proficiency that is really just a lot easier with digital media, which I wasn't always like good at. I resisted digital stuff for the longest time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but just practice. It's like anything else. Great. You've done natural history illustration, mm -hmm. both modern stuff and paleo stuff, as I understand. That's right. What is your favorite thing to illustrate? What's your favorite subject? Oh, man. I mean, obviously, extinct species and ecosystems. But <laughs> lately... I've had the opportunity to illustrate cellular um, structures. I've had the opportunity to talk about local flora and fauna, certain commissions for um, nature centers, and everything is fascinating. I've had to draw more grass and flowers and insects since I graduated than dinosaurs. <laughs> and it's all beautiful, man. It's, I thought I wanted to be like this one thing. And the opportunity to go beyond what I'm familiar with and what I'm passionate about. I mean, I'm passionate about all of it. But to, to go beyond my horizons and have to find the beauty in earthworms mm -hmm. and, you know, the ways that cells communicate with each other has really helped me appreciate not only my own field, but in science and nature in general. Um, so while I'll always choose, you know, if I had my wish, I would only draw dinosaurs and, and pterosaurs and mosasaurs and maybe a mammal once or once in a while it's, it's a <laughs> nice one uh for the rest of my life but you know after the the last year during the during the you know the thing that happened in 2020 sure <laughs> i've been asked to do a lot of things like elk and beavers and i mentioned all the grass and stuff like that you know, things that we still have on the planet with us and making those as exciting as you know, a triceratops is just as valuable because, you know, you get people to appreciate what we have today. And getting excited about what's around them mm -hmm. is the kind of radical hope that we need when I think about the future of the biosphere and the future of our planet. That's awesome. I can be a, a little part of that. So I try I try to be excited. So my answer to your question is that's really a long way of saying I like all of it. It's all my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very long cop out answer. Yeah. yeah. I when I cop great. out, I do it with style. <laughs> yes. <that>. Yep. <laughs> no, I, I appreciated you saying, you know, getting finding the thing that makes them yeah. finding beautiful. the beauty in each thing. Yeah. Because that's that's very much uh, uh, what what going into an episode topic feels like mm. is that this is the thing we're going to be talking about for you know an hour or so. Sure. You know we need to figure out what's the fascinating aspect of this because it's there. We oh, know yeah. it's somewhere in there. I'm sure I've told this story on the podcast before, but I remember the first time I was ever given the task of teaching a class. It was an intro geology lab, and I had to teach about minerals and metamorphic rocks and Oof. stuff that I thought was boring. <laughs> And I remember having the moment of going, all right, I I have to find what is interesting about like why do, there are people who love metamorphic rocks. Why do they care? Mm -hmm. Why do they love it? So that I can then bring that fascination to my class, to my students. It's such an important bit of communicating science in terms of words and concepts. I had never thought of it in terms of art that yeah. you have to find the aesthetic in each thing you're illustrating right right i think that's such a big responsibility for anyone like you and 
or me in science communication um, to treat everything with equal weight because yes. you never know like when you're going to reach someone who was unaware of this topic and is suddenly enthralled with it. Um, and they never knew like they would be that fascinated with minerals or mm -hmm. uh, with dragonflies. Like I told my grandfather recently that uh, dragonflies were like living under the water and like for like half their life and had these giant ejection jaws that grabbed prey. And then they were flying insects, but they had this whole life that was underwater. And he was like, it blew his mind. I was like, I had no idea. <laughs> but reaching someone with something they weren't aware of, I think that's a really, um, that's the opportunity with any science communication. Oh yeah. Well, and it, it makes me think about your story. Mm -hmm. You, it sounds like your first major inspiration was a toy. Yeah. Was someone's art of a dinosaur. Something That's right. that someone had made and introduced you to it, which is a very, very cool full circle story. <laughs> Look at that. It's gone full circle. Yeah. So getting back to your story and getting more towards really our story. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. The, the, you know, where we're about to get to the special <laughs> stars of the show is 2017, 2018. You discover our podcast. Mm -hmm. Now, don't know if we've talked about this much on the podcast before. The way that we initially ended up working with you on the first projects that we worked with is you reached out to us. That's right. A bold move on my part, do say so. <laughs> it was. We got an email. What was that? Was it 2018? I think 2019? so. It was 2019 because it was not yet the uh, the pandemic, right. um, but very, very close to it. And uh, I had just graduated. I just finished my internship at the ALF Museum of Paleontology mm -hmm. under Dr. Andrew Farkey. And still listening to, uh, to your podcast and at... at at some point, I was like, during my grad school time, I was like, these guys, it would be great to do art for them. Because I remember there was one project in particular, or I actually used, it was on Crocodilians, and I used your podcast as research for, yes. to assemble a species list. And so like you, the, the, the Common Descent podcast was already part of my, my workflow, my process. And what a great project. For to start with, <laughs> I'm sorry. Second wasn't... best is a really yeah, high place to yeah, start off. Really. Uh, if there was another one, I might have done some snakes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, you didn't get to that one. I didn't. Oh, I, you know, oh. just didn't have time. Mm. You got to, you got to choose the right time. Right? <laughs> Listen, you don't just do that willy nilly. The time is kind of exactly. got to be perfect. <laughs> it's always the right time for Crocs. <laughs> one does not simply draw snakes, you know. <laughs> uh, so but, you uh, reached out to us and basically said, "That's right. Let, um, let me do some art for you." Yeah, I, I told you that story, I think, and I said, you know, I, I've been listening to you guys for a while. Um, I would love the opportunity to to make art for you guys. And we had a meeting and kind of just, here's what I can do. Here's my history. Uh, we got, we kind of clicked right away, at least the way I'm remembering it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah, and um, and you guys got back to me saying that, you know, we would love, it wasn't even a logo at first. That kind of came with serendipity, right? Mm-hmm. Right. So the so to let the, the listeners in, that initial meeting ended up with the logo. So our logo that we have used, and it's still the logo. If you're listening to this on your podcast app, it's the tree. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. plain black and white. It's the phylogenetic tree. It says Common Descent Podcast. That piece of art I did using my art skills very of true. using right. uh, the line tool in PowerPoint. Yeah, which, that was your medium. That's my medium. <laughs> Almost made me fall out of my chair when I heard that. Yeah, I, I, the number of true artists that I make cringe when yep. I tell them I use PowerPoint for all my art stuff. That's how that logo came about. Yep. And it works. It, it works. It's great. <laughs> so it started out, that's how our logo started out. But nowadays you've seen, if you follow us on social media, the logo with the croc and the snake. Baskin at Coil. The table with Baskin Coil at the table. And also, if you go back, uh, if you go to our store, you go to our early episodes, there is special art of a snake and an alligator. Mm -hmm. And those are the projects that came out of that first meeting with you. Yeah. Um, that was the initial, from what I remember, that was the initial commission was we'd like some episode art. Or at least I think yes. that maybe, maybe that's what I offered. It's like, you know what? These other podcasts, they're really cool. If you want to be cool like them, you need episode art. Um, that was my pitch. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. um, and you guys are like, Croc and Snake, it's got to be. On one of my concept sketch pages, I drew them like having, like conducting a podcast, conducting a podcast. 
podcast <laughs> hosting you know <laughs> performing composing performing uh and sh- and you guys got back to me saying like that is that's the thing we want those other two things we were talking about which is on a t-shirt now which is really cool mm-hmm. but we really want we want those uh that the crock and snake at the table and um and that that became the the kind of s- like graphic pseudo logo uh for mm-hmm. the common descent and um it was a really 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 great for my portfolio to say that you know i had worked with a podcast i had done a uh, some a piece of graphic design um because as a as a illustrator an artist of any kind if you can show a range in your what you're able to do you know i can draw you know a, a, a an animal really really well with the technical proficiency uh, but i can also do graphic design um, it was a really big opportunity for me so i was almost as just as excited as as, as you guys were <laughs> <laughs> I remember feeling a little bit bad mm-hmm. at the time because you had done this individual snake and croc illustrations that were very realistic, mm-hmm. beautiful artwork. They looked fantastic. And then we came back and we're like, these are great. Can you do cartoons? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you do these like <laughs> these like car like Disney cartoon? <laughs> yeah. I remember when we because you, you sent us the initial of like, here's what I'm thinking. We're like, these look great, but also uh let's pay attention to this right now because these are this is adorable yeah we <laughs> yes. really like that that's uh yeah that that's the um you have to know how to do both like mm-hmm. you it's like you know anything and, and like i think about music like my favorite uh band radiohead there um tom york is classically trained you know if he, he can play the piano like any like like a classical pianist but um you have to start with that classical background and then move to abstraction. So as a science illustrator, I'm like, this is what I should be producing. Here's this croc, this hype, you know, hyper realistic croc that I did with pencil. This is what you're hiring me for. But I also knew, and you guys gave me the opportunity to really learn it in real life, that you need to be able to do hyper stylized as well, mm-hmm. um, which is just as valuable a skill. Can you put all this dump, all of this detail into something, but then can you also deconstruct it to its core values um, yeah. it's 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 you know essence and get just that something that is appropriate for a logo because the simpler the better and you have to know right. the whole iceberg you know it's all these metaphors <laughs> man <laughs> it makes me think of caricature mm-hmm. yeah yeah mm-hmm. and i've always been really impressed by caricature artists because they can look at a person and somehow using it surprisingly minimal number of strokes and colors they can capture the essence of this person in a very recognizable way yeah. that is a simultaneously extremely simple yes mm-hmm. and extremely cartoony and stylized right and that's always been really impressive to me i i have the same thought every now and then when they'll make uh lego figures of like actors from a movie you know like mm-hmm. here's the the star wars or the marvel movie so it it's Tony Stark, but it's Robbie D- Robert Downey Jr. Right, and somehow, and it's like, yeah, no, that's definitely RDJ as a cylinder head. You know? <laughs> it's that, like, it's that the way he arches his eyebrow. Is yep, they right. all have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. and that was a really fun opportunity for us to mm-hmm. think about because we had never really thought about. They, they basically they became mascots. Yes, that's right. Right, we were we were helping you to create mascots for the podcast. This croc and this snake, which, and I don't know how many of our listeners know this, we had to choose species. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Because I think you said, I think you asked at one point, like, do you want these to be, is this just a generic croc and a generic snake? Right, because that's not possible. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And we were like, no, they they should be specific species. Mm -hmm. So that is an American alligator. Basque Basque is an American alligator. And coil is a pine snake. That's right. And, um... Yeah, that was. I remember that being really important to me because, again, I was like fresh out of grad school, and so species lists was really important to me. And like, I have to be accurate. My allegiance is to accuracy. <laughs> and um, yeah, but after after I did that commission with you guys, um, I started to do a lot more work for uh, with um, interpretive panels for a nature center in Logan, Utah. I have an old friend who is the director of education at the Stokes Nature Center, and they commissioned me to do a huge series of interpretive panels, which kept me busy through most of 2020. And coming out of that, 
I was kind of like lost at sea. Like, all right, I'm I'm still making it as a as an illustrator. Um, I was able to leave my part time job, and if it wasn't for the the pandemic, which I hate that I'm bringing it up again, I never would have had the 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 guts to go full into my illustration career. So when I did that first project, I was still kind of doing it on the side. So when I came back to you again, I was full-time freelance science silphic illustrator. So it was like coming back, well, now that I've I've done some more work um, and I know you guys were, were coming up on, you know, we, we talked about doing more work and they were coming up in the five year and I was like, maybe, maybe I'll reach out to them, but I didn't have the idea yet. I didn't know how I would uh, approach. And I came up with this sketch. I guess we'll dive into the, the current work, the meat of the episode. Yeah. And, and we should say that before we get into that, that we did. So we worked with you the first time and we had a great time. Mm-hmm. You know, we, it, it's, I assume that this isn't always the case, that the artist and the clients get along really well and everything goes nice and smoothly. And... I mean, there's got to be rare occurrences where there, oh, that, sure. that yeah. is a, you know, a tense or sour. Yeah, one in a thousand. Yeah. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes <laughs> not really. No. <laughs> it's a bit more common than uh, than you'd think. Yeah, I what? bet. Oh, I'm sorry to, sorry to burst your bubble there. Um, yeah, well, sometimes. People are jerks about art. They, I, I have to argue to get paid. Half yeah. the time. Yeah. And to get paid fairly? People that, who don't I, know have opinions. Weird. I was going to say, freelance is tough. Yes. I was a freelance. And I still do freelance writing. That's right. I keep forgetting that, that that you did that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. For a while, that was all I did. Mm-hmm. And then nowadays, it's it's more of a side gig, like you were saying. And it's, yeah, it's a difficult... It requires a lot of self-motivation and a lot of mm-hmm. self-confidence. Yes. Which I lacked severely when I was first starting out. I came across a an entire website that was just people sharing their stories from freelance work. Yep. And it is just story after story of utterly ridiculous responses and requests and reactions from clients mm-hmm. that just just makes it boggles the mind. There's a Twitter account that I see now and then called For Exposure. <laughs> and it's the whole Twitter account is just sharing people's screenshots of conversations. Of artists especially being asked to do art for no money, but I'll put you on my YouTube channel and yeah. I'll put you on my, my, I'll share you around. That's something you can't put a <laughs> price on because I'm not right. gonna. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a whole podcast on, you know, death by exposure. Uh, <laughs> so we really enjoyed working with you. And at that time, it was, you know, relatively, certainly earlier on than today. And we obviously paid you, you know, for your art. We didn't ask you to do it for free. And we came out the other side of it going, that was really cool. When we have the opportunity, you know, because our budget is limited. And especially back then, Mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. so than today. Yes. And we had the thought in most, like, we'd love to work with Rob again. Let's put it, you know, for now, we're not even thinking about it because we've got other, we're going to Dragon Con. We've got other money stuff we're thinking about. So there was a a period after that where, you know, we had the art, we used the art, and we hadn't really caught up. We hadn't really talked with you. Mm -hmm. And then the next time we spoke, it led to the new projects, which is really the reason that we're here talking and having this special uh, episode. So the, the spoilers, the end of the story, is that we released, as part of our five year anniversary, three posters paleontology illustrations depicting the ancient scenes of the Burgess Shale, the Hell Creek Formation, and Naracourt Caves in Australia. And they are, listeners, if you have not seen this yet, if you have missed this somehow, go to our Zazzle store, the Common Descent podcast uh, page on Zazzle.com. They're so cool. They're awesome. It's such awesome art. We are so excited to have our names attached to that and to be able to share that with our listeners. And in accordance with those wonderful, again, that's that was sort of the, this is the realistic. This is a mm-hmm, scene mm-hmm. you could be peeking in on. We also put out some more cartoony stuff. Yeah. And we've got our new logo, our five-year anniversary logo, which revisits Baskin Coil uh, this time with party hats and the big number five uh-huh. uh, celebrating five years. And we were able to unveil all of that during our five-year anniversary live stream. All of those are now available on shirts and mugs and 
mouse pads? Do we have mouse pads? Uh, anyway, I haven't we'll have mouse, mouse pads, pads soon, yet, I guess. Yeah, I guess now I'm making mouse pads. And stickers, <laughs> now that I've said it out loud, you got to do it. Uh, so you can get this. We've got shirts with this stuff on mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Our friend Laura uh, from episode 84 showed us that she got mugs. Yeah. With excellent. the Burgess Shale and the Nara Court ones they on there. really good on the mugs. Yeah. It's super cool. It is very exciting art to be able to share with our listeners. And, and it was tons of fun to be able to work with you on that. So for the rest of this episode, I'd love to just go through the process, the behind the scenes of how that artwork came to be. Let's do it. And it starts with you once again, taking the initiative and reaching out to us and going, hey, guys, I've got this cool idea. And you were right. (laughs) And you emailed it to us. And that started the whole thing. Yeah. Right. So I was sketching one day, as I want to do. And um, a lot of this, this came about because I saw a particular image of someone in a, in the Redwood Forest. And, um... Most people will use social media to, like, share pictures of their cat or their latte or uh, their significant other, and uh, I'm guilty of doing some of those things myself, but primarily when I'm on, like, Twitter and Instagram, I'm looking for reference, Mm -hmm. and so I follow all kinds of art stuff, and it's uh, other artists, other illustrators, art directors, photographers, anything that might spark something in my head to be like, ooh, I can use that. Either a color palette I can sample from or a pose or a composition. And this one particular image as I was scrolling around one day made me think of a really cinematic image of something stalking through these this redwood forest and i immediately went to the hell creek and of course you got to do rexy <laughs> but and i don't know how i came th- with the idea that it should be a juvenile maybe it's a bit more vulnerable and the scene was really dark and that initial sketch sometimes you really have to, it's like pulling teeth but other times when you draw something create something it just pours out of you and this was one of those instances where i was like i'm on to something here and usually when that happens it's going to be Either just a sketch, and I'll put it on Instagram, and I'll get a couple likes, and it'll be great, and I'll have a good week. Sometimes it <laughs> becomes a final thing. Maybe they become stickers, maybe it becomes a piece of, if it's really good, it'll become like a print on my workshop. But at the time, some of my big projects were sort of slowing down, and I was like, maybe I can turn this into a job. And that was when I remembered you guys. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, I mean, you reach out for them. I think this idea, this idea of a poster, this idea of some really dramatic way of of talking about a a fossil site, it all kind of came together immediately. So I sent that off to you guys. I don't know if I had the other two at the time, if I sent you all three. I think uh, you did. Okay. I think because you pitched it to us. And I was actually going to say, it, mm-hmm. it reminds me of your story about freelance writing where you pitch mm-hmm. yeah. oftentimes. So when I was a freelance writer, I would reach out to news sites and things like that, and I would pitch a story. Mm-hmm. And I would have a similar thing where I'd learn something cool and go, oh, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. I'd love to write about this for something and then pitch it to a, you know, the Atlantic or whoever I was trying to, right. to write for. You reached out to us, and the pitch was movie poster. Mm-hmm. You said, I want to do basically movie poster scenes of fossil sites and you had shown us your original hell creek idea yep which was very similar to what it ended up being yeah really close which doesn't always happen (laughs) and also i think it was the other two so it was the chinley formation Mm -hmm. and oh what was the other one was it and um i had just seen the um well, I was, I, had, I was in Utah at the time teaching a workshop, which is what I'm doing when I'm not freelancing. I do all kinds of work, uh, workshops on nature journaling. So I was doing a nature journaling workshop in, uh, in Logan, Utah, the same place I had done the, the, the panels for. And we had just been to that big predator trap, uh, which is a big deal in the, in the Salt Lake City uh, Natural History Museum. Right. So I did that with all the allosaurs and sauropods all stuck in the mud. Right, right. Yeah, because I'm very theropod centric, you know. Being <laughs> sure, around. sure. So of course. So it was three dinosaur, right? Hell Creek right. is late Cretaceous. Chinley is Triassic. So you had pitched us this idea of these dinosaur fossil site movie posters that mm-hmm. here is depicting the site as it was back in the day, and we loved it. Yes, 
that was such a cool idea. So we saw, we started talking about the feasibility of doing something like this. And we loved that you sent us three. Yeah. The idea of it as a series exactly. was really appealing to us. And we liked the idea of the the movie poster style illustration. And we also liked the idea of essentially helping to make your project a reality. Yes. And we had had that discussion where we were talking about, you know, if we're going to put out art, we want it to be podcast related. Mm -hmm. We want it to tie into the, the themes of the podcast, the history of the podcast. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us to just do any, you know, any any old piece of art. Hmm. It should tie into our stuff. Of course. But also the idea that Rob, our paleo artist friend, this this artist that we know and who we've worked with and who we like, clearly has a passion project in mind. Yes. Not only would we love to have artwork out representing the podcast, but it would be really fun to help fund this passion project. Like, help make this a reality. Yeah. It's a great pairing. I mean, it was the right art for the right, you know, client. Not to call you guys clients, because you're, I consider you friends. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it was like, I wouldn't have pitched that to anybody else. I th immediately thought of you guys. Not because I was, like, sniffing for a job. I was like, David and Will would like this idea. Not just this, yeah. you know, a fossil site, but as a movie poster with that mm -hmm. kind of cool twist on it, with dramatic lighting. Yeah. <laughs> That got Will. Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. I, I remember the magic word. <laughs> I remember when we got it and I was like, okay, I, I, it took, I took a little coming around to it. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is cool. And I was thinking of alternatives. You were in on the movie poster idea. Yes. Yep. Immediately. Yep. I liked it a lot. <laughs> I also really liked the idea of, of supporting uh, Rob's art idea because there was a part of me that was like, we could, you know, come up with things to ask to be commissioned for. Uh, but if the artist thought of a thing to make, that's probably going to be better than the things we'd think to make. Art yep. <laughs> because I don't know. Absolutely. Draw this maybe, I guess. <laughs> so yeah. then a conversation happened. We got back to you. We said, we'd love to do this. We'd love the idea of a series of a, of a few of them. Three of them is a great number. But we wanted to change it from just being dinosaur mm -hmm. sites and try again to link it to the podcast. Right. And so the project became, what are the fossil sites we've done episodes about Yep, on the podcast? And we went through the list. You'd done quite a few. I had my pick of the litter. We, we've done a bunch. So we, we talked about Gray Fossil Site mm -hmm. and the Naracor Caves and the Burgess Shale and Maison Creek and the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, yes. And so we, we, we like the idea of linking it to the podcast in that way. And so we said, can you do this? but with a handful of fossil sites that we have episodes about mm -hmm. so that we can link it. We can say, here's this cool art, episode 89. Mm -hmm. Here's this cool art, episode 32. And it links back to the work that we've done. Right. And again, going back to something I said earlier, I, I loved that you pushed to uh, expand it beyond uh, the Mesozoic because I mean, that's why I like working with other people you know, and not just doing my own stuff for myself because it gets me to get beyond my own sight and mm -hmm. doing so I would never in my wildest dreams thought that I would enjoy doing something from the Cambrian. Um, but <laughs> the, that Anomalochiris uh, was so much fun to, to illustrate. And I had a lot of fun. Tr I had a hard time picking three fossil sites I wanted to do six. I was like, this can't be three. Yeah. This has got to be <laughs> like 12 because I had like eight ideas for the Western Interior Seaway. You that, sure did. I know. That one almost made it as part of the trio because of just <laughs> a lot of that art was a lot of fun. But it was, that would be two in the Mesozoic and that was yeah. not, it was not good. Yeah. So we got hooked on the idea of doing, if we're going to do three, let's do a Paleozoic, a Mesozoic and a Cenozoic. Right. And the next step for us was to say, all right, can we see some concept art? That's right. Some ideas of what each of these might look like. Incidentally, by the time this episode comes out, uh, we are going to put the concept art up for our patrons to see. Yeah. So if you are on our Patreon, uh, we'll put up some of that concept art and we'll share it so people can see the behind this, the background, the history of some of these illustrations that ended up coming out. And if you're like me and 
really get into concept art, it's good stuff. You're going to enjoy it. Cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we had all this concept art for a variety of different sites. You know, you had toyed around with Gray Fossil Site and Maison Creek and yep. the Western Interior Seaway. Lots of tapers. <laughs> yep, tapers. <laughs> and the way we ended up settling on our choices, part of it was we liked the symmetry, right? The Burgess Shale, Hell Creek, Naracourt ended up with this lovely... It's Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. It's also aquatic, terrestrial, subterranean. It's it's. Mm-hmm. I'm a sucker for parallels and contrasts. Right, and I right. love that sort of poetic style. And I remember, you know, and this goes back to what you were saying about finding the beauty in things. And it goes back to you talking about getting the idea in your head. Mm-hmm. There were some of those pieces of concept art that we saw. And I remember talking about this with Will that we saw it and went, clearly Rob really yeah. enjoyed doing this. Like, yep. It shows in the concept art that you had a vision and you had a great time. Like, yeah. The Nara Court concept art, when you showed us the first image we saw with the kangaroo coming down the cave, mm-hmm. it was like, man, the other stuff is cool. Like, yep. None of them were bad by any means. But that was one that we were like, that. That's awesome. We have to let you do this. Like, obviously, you had such a cool idea yeah. here. Well, mm-hmm. I have to give credit to the source material. Uh, the way that, you know, when I get inspired, whether that be, and I've done this several times when I read an article about, like, one of the ways, going back to the ALF, one of the ways I got in touch with Andy Farkey for the first time was I read his paper on combat intraspecific combat in Triceratops and how... Was that the one where he slammed the toys together? Yes! He used toys! Oh, yeah! <laughs> so Andy Farkey, yeah, 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 this yeah, was like yeah. 2000, early 2000s, I think? It's a super early paper, but I saw that yeah. and I, was, I get inspired. <laughs> or, or you know, the predator-prey restraint that uh, Denver Fowler put out. You know, I read something. The more... I, well, the research influences the arts when I see something. And it goes back to when I was a kid. When I see something that inspires me, when I heard you guys... I don't know, theorizing about kangaroos going around at high speed and then falling through into this cave. <laughs> I was like, that's that's a movie right there. Um, <laughs> and played around with composition. And the, the I really wanted to have one of those, that, that megafauna in there. And for a while, it was going to be the marsupial lion. Ooh. But that didn't work with the composition I wanted to go with, with that, that straight, vertical, very, you know, almost unrealistic movie poster-esque. Uh, composition Mm -hmm. the snake Mm -hmm. was just perfect like yeah it looks so cool and so yeah it came from listening to those episodes because when i had the list we went through we could do this fossil site or that one i went and the first thing i did was listen to each and every one of those podcasts from beginning to end some of them i'd listened to before but there were i'll admit or a couple i hadn't listened to before (laughs) and um found like either descriptions or animals that interested me or something about the way that you guys talked about the fossil site that and and so for the kangaroo that was one of them so that one came together and so there was only and we already decided that the hell creek would be the second Uh, so the real struggle was getting that third one (laughs) and i was kind of resistant and i think you guys sent picked up on that because you're like look if you don't want to do an arthropod like we we get it Mm -hmm. oh yeah well we didn't want to put you in a position where you were trying to do art that you were uncomfortable with because again, it, following the same logic of like, you had this idea, you clearly are excited about it. Mm-hmm. We didn't want to force you to do something you weren't excited about because right. A, that's not as much fun for you. And B, if you're not excited about it, no offense to you. I'm sure that you are, are, are ex- extremely talented and you can handle this. But, but odds are, I guess the art's not going to be as... <laughs> no, exactly. You know, that's my, I'm like... Yeah, if I'm not excited about yeah. a project, it doesn't come out as good. Nope. <laughs> it sure it's, doesn't. It's one of those lousy things about, you know, making art while human. You know, your your your, your right. ambition and your excitement about the subject <laughs> does does tend to uh affect the outcome. Yep. <laughs> so so I relied on again going back to like finding something interesting and the first step of that was composition and i can get really jazzed about composition no matter what it is and that was the anomalous chiris kind of hiding and seeing something that the 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 three-quarter split seeing something out in the distance and you're really close to it maybe it's the only you know everything else is very dark and the anomalous chiris is well lit something like that and you guys loved it 
There was another one I did for the Tully monster, which I, I could have sworn you guys would go for. It was very cool. I did really like that. I, one. I, I did. Yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the final compositions for anyone who hasn't seen it, or if you need a reminder, the Nara Court Caves is a, they're all vertical. They're all vertically oriented posters. The Nara Court Caves is inside the cave. And there is a kangaroo in the distance that has just fallen down f- from an entrance, a pitfall. Yeah, that is midfall. Midfall down, c- cascading down towards a pile <laughs> of other kangaroo bones. <laughs> and there's this snake in the shadow in the foreground peering out in that direction. And? And there's some water underneath it. And? And there's some bats. <laughs> some bats flying around in the there's top. There's some stalactites. Very, very cool. Some stalactites as And well. stalactites, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's all the important stuff. Yeah, I hate this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, two little croc eyes peeking yeah. out in the water, which is very cool. The Hell Creek formation is sort of an angled view, uh, looking not straight down at a scene, but sort of 45 degrees or so. Like from a tree branch. <laughs> in a redwood forest as this tyrannosaur is creeping through uh, the, the shrubs and the trees. And there's little things, smaller animals sort of hidden around the scene. And then the Burgess Shale is this underwater scene with this, like you said, three quarters. So there is a wall, a sea wall, where you've got all these sponges and corals and such. With an anomalocaris, the weird shrimpy thing. Well, it's not really a shrimpy thing. It's, more <laughs> of a, it's a weird arthropod thing. Hanging out in front of it while a trilobite is swimming by in the background. And the sunlight streaming down through the surface, which I love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, uh, I was not expecting to, to like that one as much as I did. But again, it's a, it's a great example of 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 science illustration and, and you know speak you're, you guys are talking to me it's a good example of my process of finding value in whatever i'm i'm assigned to do because my you know i'm i want to be a professional i've been able to prove that for a number of years at this point and when i'm going to do something i want to give it a hundred percent what no matter what the scale of the project is and so i try to find something to get me excited something to get me to sit down and paint it and going back to that research, like learning more about Anomalocaris, studying the fossils, learning about the history of the Burgess Shale, and getting really into the details, like how close to the surface is it? I remember asking you guys, and you're like, uh, I don't know, it's not that deep, it's not that shallow, it's mid range. So that I could, see, would sunlight be piercing? Would you be able to see those rays? And like, what kind of, you know, life forms, what else was around there? Sponges, small jellyfish type things. But really latching on to, you know, the, the main character, the Anomalocaris, and learning about it, I remember that day very clearly because I was so excited. It, it was like a turning point. Um, and I'm so glad that, I, that, that it happened that way because it was a, really a discovery for me. Um, and that's like going back to why, why I devoted myself to this career, to this, why I do what I do to get excited about things that I didn't know before. And it's really a learning process. And that kind of um, learning through that intri- your, your own intrinsic wonder and your curiosity. And like, how many of those little barbule spikes does it have on its tentacle things? Mm-hmm. And, and the fact that they found those first, and it's like, this is a weird shrimp. And then they found the rest of it. And then they found it all together. It's like, whoa, um, what a cool story. It's, yeah, it's just as exciting as Tyrannosaurus Rex. And you know, bringing up that, that, you know, hyper carnivore, the fact that this was one of the first predators, you know, back when the animal kingdom was just finding its way was a really, that was very dramatic to me and allowed me to be like, this is, this is cool. This is something new. Let me capture that, that moment of, um, the hunt, Mm -hmm. the invention of the hunt, you know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, that that's absolutely something I was about to say that I really appreciate about Anomaly Cars being part of the trio of posters, but also being alongside the T-Rex is that like, not to say that it doesn't still take skill to draw a Tyrannosaur, but people expect art of a Tyrannosaur to be exciting and engaging because it's a Tyrannosaur. Mm. Everyone thinks they're cool because they're cool. But things like Anomaly Cars don't often get that equivalent treatment. Right. So it's I really like getting to have here's two apex predators standing equivalent side by side. Yeah. Different contexts, different environments, different time periods, but 
for their environments and for those times, these were top predators. And you get that feeling. You get that feeling from an Alucard that it, it is about to go ruin some trilobites day. <laughs> uh, and I love that. I love that. You know, we get that. And then with a the T-Rex, we're not getting that it's necessarily about to go kill something, but everyone's staying out of its way. And you get that similar feeling with two very different animals. And I appreciate that. I, I, that was part of what I really liked about going with those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was a great, this project was a good opportunity for me to practice what I preach in terms of uh, being a paleo artist and, and being aware of tropes, being aware of, of modern understanding of, of these animals and treating them like animals and mm -hmm. not monsterfying them. Which is a term I got from you guys, and I and I <laughs> used frequently. Yeah, uh, we made it up. Yes. We might not be the only people who've made it up, Probably but we not. didn't take that from anywhere. That's just right. our goofy word. The TM. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Patent bending. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really nice. You know, I I enjoy quiet predators because sometimes it's almost scarier if they're sitting or stalking or being patient or you know not screaming bloody murder all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing that I really think works so well with these posters is that the idea was, like I said, movie posters. And you manage to come up with posters that are dramatic and captivating without being overly sensational. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Naracord Caves one is a bit sensational, right? It's an action scene. There's yeah. something, something cool and, and interesting and unusual is happening with a kangaroo falling from the sky, but it's based on this real scenario and there's nothing, like you said, there, it isn't just the roar. It doesn't look like a Jurassic Park poster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like it's that sort of hyperbole, that exaggeration. I really love that the Burgess Shale image is calm, mm -hmm. that it's serene with that tension of here is a predator sort of lurking over here, but you could easily look at it and immediately think, oh yeah, this is a calm, serene, lovely underwater scene. Mm -hmm. While at the same time depicting that there is this ecological interaction possible in this scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's a really great, that's a great thing to be able to show in this style. Yeah. Uh, all that to say, you did a great job. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> there's such, there's such, such, such cool artwork. I think so. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun to do, and um, it was a lot of it was a lot of work. And I was grateful for the work, but I, and I was grateful to be to be busy, to be working, um, and to be to sit down and be excited about like this huge project uh, ahead of me, um, which I have a, a, a bunch of. But sometimes they're not as exciting to sit down to as 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 painting, you know, a pile of bones, which, by the yeah. way, was was an invention for the, the, the final rendering at the sketch. It was um, I'm not yeah. sure if it if the kangaroo was even falling onto anything. And that was another thing that came about through more research. There are a lot of things that change from the sketch to the final. And those of you who are lucky enough to go and look at the concept art will see those differences and that either comes about because you know either the client says this needs something or the art will tell you you know this this is incomplete and the bones was just something that happened like i need to complete the scene what else is happening in the scene and the research you know obviously if you look at narcourt caves there's that huge pyramid of of debris and a lot of it is bones and yeah. there was just that one day when that clicked and i had a I knew I had to go in and paint all those bones and rib cages on rib cages on rib cages is not an easy <laughs> thing to paint, but man, it was fun. <laughs> I love that you brought that up because I was going to say, you know, it started with concept art and I'd love to talk a bit more about how we went from concept art to final product. Sure. And I'd love to do it poster by poster. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, because I think that's cool, a cool way to get insights into the history and we're already talking about Nara Court Caves. Yeah. So one of the things that obviously one of the things that changes is color. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a whole conversation about the time of day. Yeah. Which is uh, a good place to start. It's a whole discussion about what kind of light is going to be coming in from above, which was cool because it wasn't something I'd ever have thought about. Mm -hmm. It's like obviously the sun, I guess. Yeah. Right? There's it's the sun's what is in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so the first thing I do is I scan in my sketch. 
and put it into Photoshop and start. Um, I kind of go over my lines with a with a with a sketch brush um, to solidify where everything's going to go um, and flesh out some details and start blocking in some very simple color. The simpler, the better, because I don't want to think too much at this stage. I'm really just making sure everything looks good next to each other because those are the kind of things you don't want to change right before you turn the project in. So I was blocking in a lot of cool colors. So this is where my reference library came in really handy. I was looking at all the pictures of caves I had, all the pictures of snakes in the dark, which is something I've had to collect <laughs> now. Thank you. That's <laughs> awesome. My, and you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> my <laughs> my Google search history when I'm on a project is, is, is crazy, the things I've had to look up. <laughs> I saw a post one time talking about that from an, art, uh, an author's perspective. That there should be a button you can click on Google to say I'm an author. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, how long does a body yep. last? You know, right. What, what does is the most autopsy look like? What is the most common murder weapon? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm an author again. An essay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same thing for, for, for artists. <laughs> Man, Snakes in the Dark sounds like a great... That should be a whole series. Oh, yeah. No, that does. That sounds like a podcast in itself. Yeah. That's my next <laughs> podcast. That's my spinoff when this... When this falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked a bit after the concept arts about what things we liked. And, and mm -hmm. the next thing you sent us was the more advanced, more color versions of each. And the Naracourt Caves, I think that's when the bones came in. Mm -hmm. It's also we had talked about getting another animal in there. Mm -hmm. Because you had a snake featured very prominently in the cave art. And we fe even I felt, yeah, you yeah. know, we, it, it should be, we want to balance it out. We have a brand. As <laughs> right. all things should be. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we added a new thing in there. That's right. So the little crocodile, crocodilian. <laughs> and uh, that was fun. Um, there are tons of pictures of their eyes reflecting the, the camera or the light. And you can even see it on the water reflected back mm -hmm. so getting the chance to to draw that so anytime i can draw something new drawing all those bats um finding the right brush for for the texture of the caves was a lot of fun and i still kind of wish we had i had uh managed to put more animals in there because when i was looking at the narcor caves there were like owls and there are all those wonderful marsupials which you guys mm -hmm. go into in the episode and but it would have gotten too busy and distracting and that's it. <laughs> no pun intended. It's an easy hole to fall into. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Just want to load it up with animals um, and do what science illustration would refer to as a flyby, where you have mm -hmm. a landscape that is just packed with right. everything in the ecosystem, like the old school Zalinger stuff. Yes, where it's exactly. just Here's a hundred animals, as many as we could fit. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do a flyby. These were supposed yeah. to be just a you know a, a movie poster. With a central character, a central dramatic, with a feeling, not one of those like like the poster for Dune, which is every single character, you know, headshot. <laughs> like the mm -hmm. Avengers. Exactly. Yeah. Or the Avengers, Avengers exactly. posters where yeah. it's here's 20 people on this poster. Well, and that, that's one of the things I like about these these posters is that like flybys are fun because it's here's everyone. It's just so if you want to see what they look like and everything and, and they're in their environment as best can be fit into the scene and that's cool but it's wholly unnatural right and I've, I've you know i've definitely seen instances where that is what people are used to so used to that a, an actual image of a more natural setting seems empty mm -hmm. but that if you go outside and look around if there's not a bird a squirrel a snake a lizard and a frog all on the same tree all at the same time in view right that'd be strange so i like that these feel like someone went to each of these sites with a camera and happened to capture like a National Geographic style moment. Yeah. I like that. I like that there's, you know, other uh, residents there, but not everyone that lives in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I, that's cool. It feels very grounded. Exactly. And um, that's one of the, the first decisions I make as a science illustrator. It's something that one of my professors taught us at, at grad school was... There are two ways this can go. It's like one of those first choose your own adventure. The very first <laughs> fork in the road you come to is, is this going to be a field guide 
or a character study? Is this going to be something where you it, this image is being used to educate, to identify something, or is this used to give the the feeling of something? What yeah. is the priority? And you have to pick that right away because you can easily try to do both, and then it ends up kind of mess sometimes it works but not often you really have to choose like is this going to be where you can see the whole animal or am i going to let the tail go off the page and focus on a certain action or do i really want to make sure i capture all this so you know what i'm talking about or is it okay for it to be obscure and that was one of those the decisions i mean that we made immediately just from the way that i posed the the tyrannosaur from the hell creek it's like you're not used to seeing this view and that's a good thing this this is not your everyday piece of paleo art which is one of the things that got me into this job in the first place, was I wanted to be, uh, when I first learned that paleo art was a possible career, uh, Rugops had just been described, and the artist that they used to, um, to first render that, that animal was talking about how he was the first one to do, draw that, that dinosaur. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be the first guy to draw <laughs> a newly described species, whatever it is. If it's a meat-eating theropod, all the better. <laughs> but now, you know, with 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 time and, and experience, I have learned, you know, it is equally <laughs> enjoyable to be, to come up with a new scene of something that everyone's familiar with. And that's almost more valuable to, to reframe the conversation, the, the image that you have in your head of, of these animals. Because that's really the only way that they come back to life. It is not mosquito dna it is our imaginations that they live again yeah yeah and when i feel like it it serves the purpose that a lot of your nature documentaries that take the time to show just like you know and not that there's anything wrong with showing the sensational aspects of nature and wildlife but it is nice every now and to be like well this is what most of this animal's day looks like Mm -hmm. like here's here's the boring it eating grass and pooping right this is this is what 90% 90% of being a wildebeest is it's not always crossing the river full of crocodiles and it's not always stampeding away from lions. Usually it's not any of that. And I always appreciate when documentaries take a moment to really show the, the mundane aspects of nature because it, it grounds the animals. They're not, you know, cause they're not action stars. No, they are animals. And so getting paleo art that does, I always appreciate when I see someone who's drawn like a dinosaur sleeping. Yes. Just, yeah. You know, just taking a nap, just being as boring as an animal can be. Uh, is it alive? Yeah, right. Tapping the glass. Exactly. Yeah. Why does it make move? it move? Can you feed it right now, please? <laughs> and I appreciate that because it's it, it really emphasizes that that thing that we always try to emphasize that they're and they were animals. Yeah. They they're not monsters. They were here and they were just creatures, and so they were typically just living their lives. Mm-hmm. And that was that was one of the first things that interested me in them is that they were real. You know, I mm-hmm. I had three or you know a three dozen cooler dragons than the Stegosaurus, uh, but the fact that the Stegosaurus was real that's what got me hooked. Yes, yeah, and that's what keeps me hooked. And 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 doing doing justice to that their existence. Um, I'm getting very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to draw. Di- it's fun to draw anything that that is here or what used to be here. Yeah. Well, and I liked part of the, the fun of the artistic process for me was watching, starting with the concept mm. art and making our way towards the final version, was seeing it come to life. And yes. Seeing that realism, obviously the color and the lighting. One of the things I remember noticing, that a lot of the little details in that one, uh, the Naracourt one, the like you said, the reflection of the croc eyes in the water is super cool. It's a great little detail. I remember when I noticed that the kangaroo had become blurry. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. That you had given it motion. Yep. Right? It's not, it, it's a bit hazy and it's a bit foggy because it's in motion. It's falling. And I love that kind of stuff. And it really, those little touches really brought it to life through the process. I, I really like watching time lapse things of people making art or people sketching something up or, you know, whatever it is. And, but especially when it comes to like a, a color painting. I'll I'll watch them. They'll be like, all right, it's gonna. They'll start putting some green. It's like I don't know what's going on right now. Like I don't know why you're doing that. <laughs> this makes. And then five steps later, all of a sudden they'll go up, up, up. I go, oh, now it's come together. Yeah. And get it, getting to go through step by step as you'd come back to us to be like, all right, here's where I am so far. What do you think? I would mm-hmm. have moments like that. Like it looks good. I'm not sure exactly what's going on 
Like, All I right. don't fully understand why, what the process of how it's set up right now is, but it, what we're talking about looks great. And then the next time you come back and go, oh, I get it. Yeah. I see what you were doing now that you've finished doing it. And it was cool. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of back and forth that has to happen because uh, you want to know, for instance, to blur the kangaroo to, in a very different way, blur the snake so that it looks like it's out of focus. Um, to have all the reflection on the water, the texture on the cave, you knew all that was going to be there in the concept art. And then to take all that away and build up to it again and get through this ugly duckling stage where the art is like <laughs> kind of really gross and it doesn't look great. And you really just want to put in those details that will make it work, but you're not there yet. And there's this, there's this long process of almost the creation is – the creativity is almost completely gone and you're just make you're just – the the, the 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 mundane process of just making something um and it's just painting it finding the right brush finding the right color the right where the lighting's come does this lighting make sense with what's going on in the rest of the piece um and a lot of that is what these these pieces were where we had this great idea the great spark we, the um research had led to all these great discoveries and then there's the the long process of just the preliminary artwork where you're just building on it and um knowing what it will be when it's finished um, yeah. and you guys were really patient because it took a while um, <laughs> and there was a while a lot of ung ugly uh, ugly ducklings that i sent your way uh, <laughs> well it makes me think of videos i watch of people sculpting things and they'll be like here's a sketch of what i'm planning to sculpt it's like oh that's awesome right and they go now here's a lump of clay mm -hmm. and it's gonna look like a lump of clay for a while yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly it starts looking more and more like the sketch and yeah, it was it was cool getting to watch that happen. Mm -hmm. I think that so we we've talked a bunch about the Naracor yeah. one. The Burgess Shale poster, from my memory, I don't think it changed very much from the concept art. Certainly not in the ways that the Naracor one changed mm -hmm. with a lot of that. You know, bringing an action scene to life. But I remember when we first started seeing what really grabbed me about the the Burgess Shale one as it developed was the colors. Yeah, I love the colors on the Burgess Shale poster. It's very soothing. It's very there were a lot of cool colors, but it's very striking. It's very bright. I, I like I like the colors you chose are very captivating. Yes, thank you. And I think that was the moment. The composition was very cool. The concept sketch it already was a very nice looking poster. But I remember when I first saw the colors, and I went, "All right, I get it. Yeah, this this is gonna be awesome." <laughs> yeah, that's what did it for me on that one. And that was that was me. I had never done uh, an underwater scene before, not in school, not for myself. Like I don't think I'd ever. I'd I'd have to be hard pressed to think of a time I'd done uh, something underwater because that's not usually where I live with my art. Um, so I had to start from scratch, and I went and looked at a lot of other artwork because photographs are helpful. What does what does underwater look like? Okay, photograph. Tell me that. But I need it to already be translated into painting um mm -hmm. what kind of colors do you choose so uh, kind of kind of cheating but not really you know you're, you're 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 working with what others had done yeah you're learning from the lessons they've already figured out exactly right. translating you know, reinventing the water scene exactly right. right and i have like two pieces of paper on my wall that say that i know how to draw so i don't have to feel bad if i cut some corners <laughs> it's like well uh, right. i need to prove that i can draw it's like no nah, you're good just do what you need to do to get the job done <laughs> and i had uh, i followed a couple artists that that do a lot of underwater scenes one of them a professor of mine um amadeo um from from grad school and he's an amazing and amazing illustrator taught me half of what i know and he is all underwater he's all about fish great underwater scenes so there were a lot of images of him uh, of of his work that i color sampled from or at least got ideas because i had to because this was a completely different piece it always changes you're never just totally copying uh from what someone else has done but you're getting ideas so he was a big inspiration for where i should go for the kind of lighting i wanted the kind of murkiness or the kind of clearness that i wanted the color the temperature of the water needed to be the specifics all you ha you have an idea in your mind i'm not just like okay this person did this blue so i'm gonna do this exact same blue and it's like no i need to find this exact same thing i have an idea in my mind for what i want the burger sale to look like and 
I have to compile a bunch of images together to arrive at the that idea because it doesn't exist yet. And I don't know, I haven't done enough underwater scenes to be able to just poop that out. I have to go and collect it. And um, luckily enough, it came together, but I have, you know, my, my basic understanding of what colors look good. So I knew that the Anomalochirus should probably be warm because the composition will work better. Everything else is cool. Everything else is blue. If the Anomalochirus is red and warm, but still sort of cool at the same time, mm -hmm. it will not only pop, but it will f it will look like it belongs in that space. You don't want to make it fire engine red. You want it actually to be a bit more purple because purple that's, can be yeah. warm. And so there's all this stuff that's going on in my head and at the same time. And I'm trying to draw accurately and remember color theory and comp compose. And I'm like, ah. so I'm taking walks. If you're an, if you're a full time artist, take <laughs> walks, man. I do that when I'm writing. Yeah, I'll have it's obviously a different process, but I have that same feeling of like. I'm trying to balance and do all this stuff and I'll take a shower or I'll mm -hmm. take a walk. And exactly. it's just like, let's just clear, clear the cash. Yep. 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 <laughs> right. Right. Also, just to put it out there, this aspect of art, when you're starting getting into balancing the color theory and everything is where it turns into black magic for me. Right. Uh, that's. <laughs> oh ridiculous. yeah. Now you're colorblind. Yes. It's a little bit black magic for me. Yes. That's not just your personal visual disability. No, like, no. That's that's a very specific. I skill. feel that way with even the colors I can mm -hmm. see normally. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm I I will always say I'm I'm not a painter. I I get by because I know what's supposed to work, and I look at enough other art to to say this is this is what I'm going for. And so I'm always for every one p illustration that I do, I will have looked at two hundred other pieces to get an idea for what I want what I want the original. You're only as good as your reference library. Yeah. And I have a catalog in my head. Every time I find something new, like these underwater scenes for the Anomalochirus, I'll stare at them. And I just kind of like, I'm thinking, it usually happens in the concept, the concept art stage where I'm just like, I've seen an image that is exactly, like that would work for this idea. And I usually have to think and stroke my beard a while and be like, where did I see that? And it'll usually be in a book and I'll go and I'll find it or it'll be an image. And I'm like, no one was on Instagram. And I'll spend a day scrolling through all the things I've <laughs> saved and I'll find it. And uh, and it's it's the data that, you it's, you know, it's the, the clay that you need to make of those bricks. Yes. And one of those things I found was, was you know, I, I know what the Anomalochirus needs to look like. It needs to be this red. Um, and I went to these the lobsters when before they're put in the pot and they turn bright red they're this beautiful kind of bluish color and purples and it was perfect go and find a good lobster sample those colors and thank god it worked otherwise i'd have to go back to the drawing board <laughs> <laughs> and the picking colors for extinct species is very very challenging but it's fun um to to be like what's an appropriate color for this thing um you know mm -hmm. what what is its role in the ecosystem what kind of environment what eco what environment was it living in what would make sense for it what did it does it what should it be countershaded should it be very bright being displaying thinking about the animal's role as a real animal will allow you to choose those colors i love how every single t-rex these days is kind of a gray blue or a gray purple because that seems to be the consensus. Well, it's big, so maybe it's like make it like an elephant or a whale color. You know, it's mm -hmm. not really. It's kind of ambushy, so sure, it's dark, but it's it probably doesn't have like a giant red face, although that might work sometimes. And there's <laughs> something I landed on with Velociraptor. It's almost exactly like a coyote. Velociraptor does not feature in these posters, but it's a good example for something I've done. This, which I had to apply <laughs> to every animal that we that are in these posters. It lives in this kind of deserty area it's it fits with its level in the ecosystem and the tropics uh, system it might want to blend in it's kind of small and it was it's like well, perfect you don't want to go with something like an eagle because it's doing something completely different a lot mm -hmm. of people will like just associate rat you know dromaeosaurs with birds so it helps to have an understanding of modern day animals in that regard like what fits for anomalochirus maybe a maybe a lobster yeah yeah well, I, I i'll say at up until this conversation, it never even occurred to me to question the colors yep. of the animals in this artwork. Oh, yeah. They were all considered like heavily. <laughs> yeah, which makes total... And I, and I know that logically. Yeah. It's like, yeah, obviously you don't know what colors these are. And you had mm -hmm. to do the normal paleo art thing and come up with decisions. 
But at no point did I look at them and go, that's an interesting color. It, well, yeah. it feels very natural, the yes. colors that you went with. And ironically enough, the ones that we probably know for, like, almost for certain with the uh, Narakor caves, they're all kind of dark. So you can't yes. even really see right. their colors. And I almost, like, <laughs> shot myself in the foot. It's like, these colors will be easy. You're not going to see them. Yeah, but that's not what matters here. It's not. Now, it's not. now with the Hell Creek Formation poster, that's one where we knew what that was going to look like from the start, because that was the first thing you sent to us. Mm -hmm. And what sticks in my mind about the process of that one is that the first image was really trees and a T-Rex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as it came together, I loved watching, not only are there other animals in it, right? There's a snake hidden among the bushes and there's a, a pachycephalosaur, if I remember right, way mm -hmm. in the back with the trees. For me, watching the plants come together mm -hmm. yeah. was so cool to see the wood texture come into play. And there were many stages of shrubs and bushes becoming more complex and more realistic so many ferns <laughs> yeah coming into focus was a very cool process to watch yeah uh well i'm glad i was enjoying to watch um <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of when i was a kid i used to i went through a phase in like ninth grade where i drew dragons for like a year mm -hmm. and there were a few where i was like this dragon's gonna have tiny scales and then it was just a day oh boy. of yep. doing tiny scales across yeah. the whole body i have made a mistake yep <laughs> i was like why did i do this i kind of i felt like that you know i was like why did it have to be ferns <laughs> <laughs> there there are three things that that will change you know when you go from the concept sketch to the final and they can be like the good the bad and the ugly and like the good can be like oh this pile of bones excellent and you know the bad would be like well i have to um get rid of all of these other animals that i wanted to include or and then the ugly is the the, the raw fact of having to draw 80 ferns in perspective <laughs> <laughs> and have different kinds of light falling on them at different points in time and being interrupted by layer masks and how to manage that. Not in the, So there's a lot of technical things you have to also remember that kind of make it easy, but also you have to work around because the Tyrannosaur was on its own layer and its own mask, so it wouldn't interfere with anything. But the where its foot touched the ground, they needed to interact and so I needed to paint that in to either cover the layer mask or what was ended up being easier is included in the T-Rex. So there are mm -hmm. ferns that are in its layer and those had to mesh seamlessly into the ferns that were around it and the shadow had to make so that there, there were like, I spent, I think, like a week on just the shadow of the Tyrannosaur. Yeah. Wow. Making it fade gets it's a little sharper at closer to the feet because it's closer to the source of the shadow and it's a little fuzzier as you get further away um it has to like look like it's sitting on the ground i think shadows are one of the hardest things um, mm -hmm. to do next to like bushes and people like a bush of a shadow like a, 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 a an illustration of of a shadow of a, of a bush and a person would probably be the hardest thing you could assign <laughs> me to do because that's tough or a hand <laughs> shadow's really tough because it's one of those things that grounded in realism it's one of those things that make you believe that what you're looking yes. at is in is situated in a in in space and the space makes sense yeah it's because like you know the shape of an animal or the pose of an animal is something that shifts based on the whim of the animal you mm -hmm. know so like you can put them in a pose and as long as it's not breaking their anatomy it's like yeah no that's a pose that animal could make and that's perfectly natural F shadows are physics yes like, yes shadows do what light and shape dictates there is no whim going on it is pure physics so it's it, you're having to you're having to be a physics engine of a video game to create <laughs> realistic looking shadows <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. There's a reason early video games didn't have shadows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and those things are, are things that we are so accustomed to seeing just because mm -hmm. we've lived however many years you've lived staring at things in the world that it becomes really easy to spot when something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you if you look, you see even some of the pieces that I'm very proud of, if you go and look at my shadows, uh, don't go and do this listeners <laughs> if you go and look at my shadows you can see like oh okay he's kind of struggling with that and, you know it's sort of a telltale but it's also something that is nice to do and also sort of cringy as an artist to go back and look at your old work and say 
I didn't even try to do the shadow in this one. Or this shadow is, <laughs> is way too hard. Um, I did not. It's, it's going off in the wrong angle. Looking back on those things that you know you struggle with and seeing how far you've come is something that you know it can help you tackle, like tackling this this new shadow. And having other people who are artists really help. I was lucky enough to have a lot of people from from my grad program that I'm still in contact with that are phenomenal, phenomenal artists and gave me a lot of great feedback, especially on the shadow and being like, hey, here's how here's how I would approach this. And not just the artsy fartsy kind of approach, but technical, like this kind of layer with this sort of um you know, filter on it and use this kind of brush. And I think you, it's, it's perfect because the concept is the hard part, getting it and knowing that the shadow has to look and fall on this way on these ferns and fall in between the gaps of the fern and onto the, and react differently to the plant that it does to the soil. That's the hard part. And then actually applying that, it's like, well, you know, you, you just go look in a, in a, in a, in a cookbook sort of thing it's like all right just just do step one step two step three you've done the hard part by conceiving of this shadow now go ask some friends go ask the internet how to actually apply it yeah um, and a lot of people think they have to just figure that out on their own but there's so many people doing this and doing demos here's how i draw this it's not the right way to draw this it's how i approach it and that's some of the value of, of being an artist online because they don't you know, they're just like, how did you draw this? And I've been getting that question since I was a little kid. And be like, well, let me show you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I still can't believe anybody is interested in how I did it. <laughs> <Because I'm laughs> it's a fascinating process. Absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing that came about later on in the concept art stage is the text. So each of the posters has words in it. Now, your original concept art had words. That's if right. If I yes. remember correctly, it had the big mm -hmm. bubble letters that said the Hell Creek Formation. But then we had kind of, you know, that wasn't the important part of most of our artistic discussions. Mm -hmm. So it was really later on, the very late stages that I remember you starting to experiment with the texture of the words and we did a little back and forth on what exactly we wanted the words to be we mm -hmm. talked about how much words do we want it to say the age do we want it to say this yeah so there was a bit of back and forth on exactly what text do we want where should it go and what does it look like mm -hmm. and then i think it was the last thing i think the last thing we did was add the little logos yep 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 which was built on that original movie poster idea that mm -hmm. we would each have that. And you, you, we, we basically said, Rob, can we get, you know how on like a movie poster, it'll have like the little Paramount logo yeah, the or studio yeah, the studio logo. Emblems. And we just said, just make something up. Mm -hmm. And you came up with the lead, like the Oscars with the yeah. leaves on the sides for, for the common descent and for your Raptor head logo. And it's super cool. It, That's such I, a yeah. wonderful little touch at the end. I love it. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, the words were fun. I remember I remember going back and forth about uh, how to, because everything needed to, to be on an equal field, and what how to refer to the site, naming the countries. We had different countries, and we had different um, time periods, obviously, but also the formation, how to refer to... The Hell Creek, I remember that was a big discussion. It's like, I'm not listing all these states because the Hell Creek takes place in yes, all I... of these states. Is there a precedent for just referring to it as, you know, the the Badlands of whatever? Right. And we had a, a bunch of discussions about the word the. Yep, yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> this is what happens when you're in graphic design. <laughs> yeah. Where does the the go? Like the little the above the words? Do we say the with each one? Mm -hmm. At one point, I think the the was only there for... Maybe it was the Burgess Shale. It was only there for one of them. Or, yeah. That's right. And it looked imbalanced, and we had all these discussions about how to mm -hmm. parallel the text. And I didn't know how to incorporate, though, with some of them. And so, you know, like I've been talking about before, when I don't know what to do, I go and look at what has been done before. It gave me good ideas. And it was actually um, the text treatment for The Walking Dead and the way that they had the, oh, yeah. the very small above the main thing it wasn't in line flush like i was initially trying to do it was way up on it's kind of like this random place and it's like that might work and i put all the thes and made them lowercase and and it, and you guys seem to like it and that was a lot of fun i knew they want that i wanted them to be bold and white kind of blocky letters clean sort of sans serif 
Um, and uh, one of the fun things, one of the, my favorite parts of my job is is finding the right text for the image. And this usually can only happen after it's almost done. So I have a real atmosphere to match it to, the work I can match it to the right, does it look good? And it's really just the process of downloading a bunch of fonts that you think will work and going through each one of them and like living with it because you can't tell by just look that some people who are probably more skilled than I can look at a font and say that will work with this and mm -hmm. that'll kind of get you halfway um, but you really don't know until you sit there and live with it and they all ended up being these various versions of sort of an eroded old text blocky yeah. text that had been chipped away in various different stages and so like the narcor cave is very almost horror film which fits for for the kind of image it turned out to be mm -hmm. and so on and, and i think like uh hell creek is a bit woody and for burgess shale it's it's kind of almost like rock like coral it, it feels like rough like something that you'd find on the beach yeah. or something that was another thing, like the colors. Uh, that was one of those things that you did it, and I would not even have thought about that. Yep. This is why we hire an artist. Yep. There you go. This is why you hired an artist, people. That's right. Because, <laughs> yeah, I could have drawn something, and it would have you wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that the fact that you made all the text different, I wouldn't even have, have thought to suggest that. And, actually, you bring up another good point that I forgot to mention. We liked the three that we chose for the parallelism of each is the the different eras mm -hmm. paleozoic mesozoic cenozoic but also they're different countries mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right they each come from different parts of the world different countries they're different habitats they feature different kinds of animals mm -hmm. and it's it's a very cool they, they turned out to be a great trilogy yeah exactly and then the other fun behind the scenes note so we started discussing this 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 whole process was across the fall of 2021 mm-hmm of last year and we were talking about which ones we want to do and hell creek posed a little bit of a conundrum for us because we liked the hell creek poster that you had originally sent us and we knew that that was that was how it started that was your passion project that mm -hmm. you had started with and we were like you know it'd be really nice not only do we like it it'd be really nice to let you do the thing that sparked the whole idea right but we didn't have a Hell Creek episode. Mm -mm. And the whole point was to do episodes, do saints that we had done episodes on. Burgess, Shale, and Narcor Caves, we had done episodes 89 and 32. But we hadn't done a Hell Creek formation episode. It was on the request list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So our listeners had requested Hell Creek, but we had not actually done it. So Will and I sat down and we went, well, I mean, this art's not going to come out for a few months. Let's do the Hell Creek episode. Yep. Let's get it on the list. <laughs> we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so that it is out in time for this artwork to come out. So we fast tracked Hell Creek. Yep. <laughs> so that the art would still match that this, theme. This was my this is my my secret plan all along was to influence the uh That's right. The yes. set list <laughs> of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a it was a good episode to listen to. It gave me some ideas. It was um, fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't I, I wished I had been able to work in a uh, a giant herd or something like would have been great to do like a like a huge herd of triceratops in the very 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 back of the poster mm -hmm. uh kicking up dust and stuff but that would have i don't think it could it was it was feasible even to do like a shorthand version of him yeah yeah it just would have it was too much well that brings up a really good point and it is that if people like these posters and want us to do more of them, mm. let us know you like them and share them around and buy them out of the Zazzle store on our merch because that is how we will know that people enjoy it. That's right. And if, if these are popular and if people like it, there's concept art for at least three other posters. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we That's can right, yeah. absolutely do more of these. Yeah, and it, it seems like people are enjoying them. Uh, the launch was really fun. I actually just went back and 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 rewatched the live stream when you guys presented them, and just looking at the comments and seeing them, you guys talk, present them, and unveil them was was a lot of fun. You know, as a fan, uh, as someone who enjoys paleo art, you know, genuinely. It's it's always good to draw something or to create something that you yourself would be a fan of. Like, this is yeah. really cool. I would enjoy this if I hadn't done it. But it's also exciting when it is your work, uh, when mm -hmm. it's lived yeah. 
in your computer, you know, very intimately with you for a, for months, um, and you know every inch of it. And now it's on someone else's screen, and they're talking about it. it's in their hands. And you're like, it's like watching your your child grow up. <laughs> I had the same feeling whenever I see any of my work, like in situ in in a museum or on on display somewhere i'm like oh there it is like i remember putting in that little line (laughs) that part never really turned out all but it's doing okay and see it seems to be seems to be doing all right people seem to like it all it's eating uh, well yeah it's it's eating well and i have that baby and i get that that sense to talk about uh the fourth piece we haven't talked about at all uh whenever i'm online these days i'll usually see the five-year logo yep so we finished the three. We finished the three posters and they turned out great and it was fantastic. Uh, those, like I said, those are up on our Zazzle store. If you want to see the unveiling in the live stream, it's on our YouTube channel. And then we talked about the logo. Like all that had already been finished. Mm-hmm. And then we said, hey, we had kind of in the process, we had thrown out this idea of doing a five-year anniversary logo. Yes. Like at the beginning, it was like a little seed you planted. Like at the end of the meeting, the first yeah. meeting, you were like, <laughs> by the way, five years coming up. Maybe a new logo, food for thought, and I was like, okay, and yep. uh, and I went. You can, I go and look in my sketchbook. There are, are immediately following that conversation. I started uh-huh. thinking. <laughs> it worked, and, it worked. And that was very funny in terms of just the back and forth discussion and figuring out what we wanted. The five year anniversary logo was harder to put together than the posters. Were. It really was, <laughs> and. Um, I'm not sure 100% why. It's like one of those accidents that happens in space. You're like, well, <laughs> we'll never know. Well, I think that because you had put together some really cool concept art. Mm-hmm. And I think that it was an experience. You know, you you had mentioned at some point earlier in this discussion that you were happy that we pushed for certain things. That you were happy that we pushed for a Burgess Shale yeah. to get you sort of out of your comfort zone. And it turned out really well. We, I remember Will and I looked at some of the early concept art for the five year logo. And we were like, this is good, Like this is, this is good. Mm-hmm. It's not what we want. And we're not sure why. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Like we had to have a bunch of discussions. All right. What this is, th- we, we have a very specific idea Yes. in mind with the posters. It was very much like, Hey, you, we've got a general sense. You, the artist, you make your thing mm-hmm. and we will, we will give feedback and we'll advise, but that was really your art. The logo we found, we had a very, like, we were like, no, it's, it really does have to fit a particular idea in our That's brains. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that made it hard. It made it hard to figure that out. It also made it hard because it meant we had to go, hey, all this art you've sent us is great. But we don't, no. But we don't want this. No. <laughs> we don't. So back to the drawing board. We <laughs> which, don't like any of this. <laughs> which is, which I was, which I'm really grateful that you guys did that. Because a lot of clients, it's almost a trope where, you know, you'll see, you'll see those like, I don't like this. And the artist will say, well, what do you want? And they'll be like, I'll know it when I see it. And I was like, that doesn't give me anything to work with. Yeah, yeah. Just draw all art and I'll pick it out of the lineup. All art. I want from Monet to... uh, (laughs) To Monet. To Monet, exactly. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I should know these things. Yeah, so it was a real back and forth. And like I said, I'm grateful that you guys were like, you know, we really want it to be a... A redrawing, uh, like a, a redesign of the old idea. Mm-hmm. These two characters at a table doing a podcast, but something is different. It's five years, and that needs to be celebrated. And I, I think I was resistant to to revisiting that old idea. I thought you know it needed to be because we had discussed early on about how uh, Pokemon Go had done the five year with the balloons and Pikachu thing and I think mm-hmm. I was like it needs to be grand it needs to be a camp they have to leave the table the table's gone <laughs> yeah well I think you were very reasonably hesitant now we, we say our idea the original logo was yours yes. you, know, well. you made that that composition <laughs> was all you're doing the original yeah, the original snake and croc logo I mean and I think I got the impression you were very hesitant to do something too similar mm-hmm. because you didn't want to just give us the same thing again yeah so the way that i tackled that 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 problem was it's been you know a a short amount of years since i did that project but in terms of what i've the kind of the art that i've made since then it's been a a very 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 long time that doesn't really make sense how can i rephrase it's get it time-wise short amount of time but i've done so much since you've grown 
I myself, yeah, my my yeah. my powers have doubled since last we met, <laughs> uh, and uh, and I really want. Okay, let's let me show not only David and Will, but everyone who's looked at this logo what what I've learned in the in the in the interim, and so I gave them a complete you know this sort of the same pose, but I spent a lot of time repainting the uh, basket coil and getting a lot of those variations in the crocodile's uh, scales to show through. Yeah. I didn't limit myself to just doing it in Illustrator. So the first logo is all vector, which does limit exact, like the kind of rendering you can produce. I am slightly more comfortable in Photoshop, but combining those two programs is will get you to to a place that you can showcase all of all of my talents and it's it's a stage that that needed to happen for the posters so that text was done in a different program than photoshop and getting to work in those simultaneously sometimes i'll be adjusting something in the painting and it'll immediately show up in indesign which is where i built the text and going back and forth between those two programs to to come up with a, with a final image uh, it was a similar process with the with the five year logo. I wanted to paint them to the best of my ability, which meant using Photoshop, but then also compile them and create certain elements that would work better as a vector, like the microphone, like the the cord that's coming off of the microphone. That was something that was sort of just whimsy in the first logo and kind of helped as a compositional element in the in the second one. So. Yeah, I, I guess the the long answer is the short version of the long answer is uh, redrawing it and having fun um, revisiting them and like and, and and using it as a real benchmark for how far it's been since since twenty nineteen. Oh yeah, and it looks great. Oh yeah, it really. Well, and does. It, it was uh, funny, like you're saying, where you'd give us concepts and we're like, these are cool, and you're doing really neat stuff. Uh, we would like more of the same, please. Yes, <laughs> could you just make it? Just like the other one you yep. did, and we we definitely had moments of like, th- that's okay to ask, right? We can say that. We can, oh yeah, <laughs> we can, <laughs> you just do the thing you did before, but better. Yeah, just again, again, you know, again, again. Just yeah, <laughs> another yeah. Lightning strikes twice, right? Yes. Right. Well, and the trick with the logo is that you know with the posters, it was fun to be like, oh yeah, make as much detail and whatever, however you want to do it. The logo was very much like this is going to be a thumbnail. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Most people are going to see this, and it's going to be an inch, an inch across. So we have to make it pretty simple and not get too cluttered. And we want the words in there mm-hmm. that say five years. The very, very last thing we did was decide on the color of the five. Yep. 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 It's the number five, and mm-hmm. we went through a few different options of what is do we want it to have a color. It was a very different process, yeah. a, a wholly different process from doing the posters. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to like what we were talking about at the beginning with the original logo. The whole thing is almost like a, a sequel to our first to our first work together. It was yeah. a very technical, highly you know rendered illustration, and then a logo. And can you do both for the same client? with the same amount of technical proficiency and, and make them both look good. And, uh, you know, bless you, yes. bless you guys. Yeah, giving me that opportunity to, <laughs> to be like, yes, I can't do this. Oh, God. Well, we can do, we'll do part three, uh, 10 years. Yep. There you know, go. 10 year logo. We'll do the next oh, run boy. of posters. So yeah. block, block that out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Get in touch with us in 2026. <laughs> we'll start, start preparing. So so anxious. Some of the aging that happens with that, with, with uh, crocodiles and snakes, you know. Yeah. <gasps> Yeah. Oh, that would be so cool <laughs> if they started getting older. <gasps> oh, I love that the idea. The alligator will start getting too big for the table, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's been eating good. <laughs> it was so much fun to put this artwork together. And it was it was really cool to see how the process of proposing an idea and saying, we'd like it to be like this. We'd like it to fit this scheme. We'd like it to have this end result. Here are the goals. Here's the mission. Mm-hmm. And watching it come to life and being able to work with an artist who is not only talented and not only knows how to do all this stuff, but also gets it. Yeah. You know, you, you, we, we were talking about this before we started recording. You are a very similar age and you are a very similar overall demographic to us as people. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we share a lot of interests and we share a lot of insights 
And then also someone who's just very agreeable to work with. Someone who it was a lot of fun to have Aww. these discussions with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've been talking around the, the celebration of five years. You know, we unveiled some artwork. Artwork that you did and also artwork that our friend Anna did. Mm-hmm. Which is mm-hmm. also really fun. up there. It's great. It's, it's so fun, the Anna art, because it's a very different style. Yeah. It is much more cartoony and it's much more silly. Mm-hmm. So Anna did the Megalodon. The mm-hmm. Rip Megalodon. Yes. <laughs> Tombstone. So much fun. That shark. <laughs> I could never do something that cute. Like, that <laughs> was very phenomenally cute. cute. I, yeah, I, I love how cute her art is. <laughs> and the two old men. Yeah. Uh, me and Will. The the Statler and Waldorf style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, of, it's, they're very cute. They're very cartoony. They're very fun. And we got to unveil all this artwork. But the other thing that we've been talking about repeatedly in the time around the five-year anniversary is we've been celebrating the growth of the Common Descent family. Yeah. That for so long, it's been us two. Mm -hmm. Just doing the podcast, and really in the last year or so, we have started to solidify the fact that there are other people regularly contributing and making the podcast what it is. Obviously, Allie is now a regular guest on the show. Mm -hmm. Will's brother helped us with the Discord. Yep, yep. We've got... This, this sort of growing family and uh, arguably the first sign of that, the first person inducted into the w- making a, an integral part of the podcast experience was Rob, our paleo mm-hmm. artist Aww. to go. And now Rob is back to celebrate five years with us. And wow. it's it's been really cool to have you as part of the Common Descent experience. Well, thank you. Um, I think it's a testament to the quality of the show that you guys are producing. You know, it's very... It's, how do I backhand compliment you guys? Uh, it's very <laughs> pure. It's very s- simple. You know, it, it, it's it's not a big flashy kind of crazy noise noisy thing. Um, it's like we're, we know about this stuff. We find it fun and we want to share it. And through that, I think the, the 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 family that you've gathered around speaks to the quality of the content that you guys are producing. That people want to be a part of it. I like. I wanted to be a part of it. Um, it was something that that kept me company in California when I was at grad school because uh, my wife and I were in you know different states, and so I was very much alone for many many hours um in my studio making work and one of the people one one of the you know the things that kind of kept me company was this podcast i can remember very clearly being super lonely and then listening to the baculum episode and feeling a hundred percent better um, <laughs> <laughs> or the, sp- awesome. the the spinosaurus episode and and say, and and then using the podcast for the work for for my own work and saying like i would it would be so cool to return the favor almost to be like you guys have given me so much let me return the favor with what i can do and it'd be really really cool to be a part of what you guys are producing because I, I there's i can feel the the value in there is very evident to me and i think that speaks to everyone else who's wanted to be a part of your podcast and it's all kind of we love nature, we love science, and this is something that we want to see more of. And um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's amazing to see how, to see the growth and to be a small part of it. It's an honor. It really is. I'm not, <laughs> it is not hyperbole. I'm, I'm very honored to be you to be a to be the the paleo artist <laughs> you are more than anyone you are the official paleo yep. artist of the Woo. common descent podcast yep, yep, yep. obviously we get fan art sure from a lot of our listeners and we we showcase that and we love it mm-hmm. uh anna has done art for us we've talked with some of our other friends about potentially doing some art for us in the future I've done a bunch of art for us, <laughs> right? That's I did right. the original logo, the spooky shirts. <laughs> yep. the spooky That's shirts. all me. Yeah. Exactly. I did those. Credit where credit is due. That's exactly. PowerPoint. That is, I did, that's you know, clip art and silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows PowerPoint like you do. <laughs> that's right. I'm a PowerPoint <laughs> wizard. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, the, the official, the artwork that is up front on the social media, mm. on a lot of the merch, that is Rob Soto art. And it is delightful wow. to have that there. And now to have you on the podcast. I can't believe it. And this is a little behind the scenes for our, our listeners 
is we had talked about this idea while we were working on all the five-year art. We were talking about the idea of getting Rob on the podcast. Oh, maybe we can do a special episode and sort of showcase the the behind the scenes and the process. And Rob, you were extremely excited about that idea. I was. <laughs> yep. I, I fanboyed a little bit. I was like, yeah. can, I, can I be on the podcast, please? And absolutely, yeah. We'd love to have you on here. Listeners, we hope that you've enjoyed this discussion with Rob. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. It's been really great to hear your perspective and your insights. One more time, listeners, if you haven't already, check out the art. If you didn't watch the live stream, you can watch it again on YouTube. The artwork is on sale on our Zazzle store, Zazzle.com. Search for Common Descent. Shirts and mugs and pillowcases and all sorts of stuff you can get these pieces of artwork these illustrations that uh, we've just been discussing here mm -hmm. on this episode it's good to own work it's good to you like something go and put it on your wall and start collecting it's nice to have something that isn't on a screen go and own <laughs> some art you know <laughs> it's the human experience it is we've got it we've got all the artwork on shirts yep 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 yeah, the new logo is just super cool. Oh. I have the old logo on a mug, and I told myself I have to get the new logo on a mug so I can have them side by side. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nice. Nothing like yeah. buying your own art. That's right. <laughs> so buying your own merch. A little bit. Can I get a discount? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not no. even in charge of it, so we can't even uh, give you. We can't even control that. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd give ourselves discounts. That's right. That's right. No, the money's going to a good place, right? <laughs> Rob, thank you again for joining us for this special episode. It's been a delight to talk to you. Listeners, as always, just like Rob did, keep engaging with the podcast. Find us on the social medias. Find us on Discord. Comment on our stuff. Join us on Patreon and subscribe and help support the podcast. And wherever you are listening to this episode, go to the comments or the social media or the Discord, whatever you want, and leave some love for Rob and for yes. the art and tell us some of your experiences. What do you like about the art? What have you purchased of the art? Do you have any of it on merch? We'd love to hear from you and your perspectives and what you enjoy. And again, if people really like this artwork and this kind of artistic collaboration we will do more of it we will be happy to do it we know a great paleo artist <laughs> that's right i'd love to know what the listeners want the next art to look like what kind of oh, yeah. fossil sites they'd be interested in us traveling to absolutely very cool well with that why don't we go ahead and wrap this up we return yeah. you to our regularly scheduled fortnightly main episode topics Happy five-year anniversary to us. Happy five years. And stay tuned for more cool five-year stuff happening across 2022. One more time, last time. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, guys. <laughs> and we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.